Okay. Hello and welcome everyone. I am here with Dr. Kristen R. Godsey, the critically acclaimed author of Why Women Have Better Sex Under Socialism and Red Valkyries, Feminist Lesson Lessons from Five Revolutionary Women. And we recorded a podcast late last year on Why Women Have Better Sex Under Socialism, actually, which is a very important talk. So I have linked that below for everyone to check out. Uh, but we're here today to talk about her new book, which is Everyday Utopia. And this explores two millennia of human experiments in living differently to inspire radical hope for a post-capitalist, post-patriarchal world. Kristen is the professor and chair of Russian and East European studies at the University of Pennsylvania, and her writing has been published in innumerable outlets. So thank you, Kristen, for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for the invitation. It's really fun to be here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I prepared a list of guiding questions that we're going to go through first. And then if there's time at the end, we're going to field some audience questions. Um, so I will be monitoring, monitoring the chat throughout, but you might want to save your questions until the end so that there's more of a chance that I will actually see them. Um, so I would like to start with the importance of utopias and utopian dreaming, which is a, a very prominent theme in the book. So in your opinion, why is practicing radical hope and what Ernest Bloch calls militant optimism so vital in our collective struggles? And relatedly, what inspired you to share this with the world? Yeah, so I mean, I think that the I'll answer the first part of that question or the second part of that question first, because okay. it sort of will flow into the, the first part, which is, you know, when I wrote Why Women Have Better Sex Under Socialism, which is a you know book that kind of took on a life of its own unexpectedly. It was really written in a very particular moment in the United States, you know, or during the Trump era. And it was it was sort of a book to kind of galvanize young people to kind of like care about what was happening in the world um, yeah. and to present this other alternative. And you know, one of the things that really came out of that is um, as that book found its life and sort of got translated into other languages and made its way around the world is that I was started doing all these lectures and talks. And a lot of people were really excited to learn about these alternatives and like different ways of organizing our lives that are outside of the framework of capitalism. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, when I would actually start digging into some of the nitty gritty of like what it would take to fix things, there would be this reaction of like, oh, well, that's just utopian. Like that'll mm -hmm. never happen. That's impossible. Mm -hmm. You know, like yeah. um, it's good in theory, but it'll never work in practice. I'm sure you've heard all of those kinds of oh, yes. days. Yeah. Right. Yeah, 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 so, yeah. so I was really, I kind of like ran with that. Like this was during, you know, the early part of the pandemic. I was really um, the paperback version of that book. I think came out on March 3rd, 2020. And so it was like, and then like nothing happened because of course the pan, the world just sort of stopped. And so I had all this time to kind of process what was going on with um, the previous two years. And, and I started really thinking about this concept of militant optimism or radical hope. Mm -hmm. And really in contrast to this idea of the critical theorist Mark Fisher's idea of capitalist realism, right? There is no mm -hmm. alternative. We are stuck in this particular way of, of living, of capitalism, of patriarchy, of white supremacy, of all of these structures that feel really impervious to change. And yet, mm -hmm. at the same time, as somebody who, especially in my case, has studied the history of 20th century state socialism in Eastern Europe, and knows that people living in the Soviet Union prior to 1991 or people living in Eastern Europe prior to 1999, you know, they also thought that nothing would ever change. They also really profoundly believed that this whole edifice of political economy within which they lived was just impervious to change. And then one day overnight, it ended. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think that that is a really kind of interesting inflection point to think about what if our world, like, and the pandemic, right? Everything just stopped, right? Mm -hmm, <laughs> we were like mm -hmm, talking mm -hmm, along and doing whatever we were doing and then suddenly the world shut down. Mm -hmm. so, so part of what allows for radical social change or significant social change is people who are actively dreaming of different ways of being in the world. Mm -hmm. And in the book, in the very beginning of the book, I talk a lot about what I call sort of techno-futurism and a variety of books that have come out recently that are, you know, really about changes that we can make to the public sphere, to our economies, to our polities that will kind of make us live more just, equitable, and sustainable lives in the future. But one of the things that those books largely overlook is the private sphere. Mm -hmm. And for what I wanted to do in this book, building off why women have better sex under socialism, was to really talk about, well, what are some utopian imaginings 
for our private lives, for our families? And what are the histories of those utopian imaginings? And how do those utopian imaginings, how have they always been and how will they continue to be sort of essential for human survival? And I really mean survival. Like we as humans are incredibly flexible and adaptable and creative as a species. And, um, and often that creativity that allows us the adaptability and flexibility that we need to meet different geographic or climatic events or changes in the way we live our lives in the world often comes from these utopian thinkers off on the margins. And so this is really a book thinking about utopia and utopianism as an essential human tool that helps us adapt and be creative in the face of great obstacles, especially those that we'll be facing in the immediate future. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I, it's so important to me. I, I think that, you know, capitalism, as we know, really robs us of our ability to think outside of the system. And you included that beautiful quote. Um, I am blanking on who, it, who it's from right now, but along the lines of, you know, um, her, or no, utopia is on the horizon and I walk towards it, but every step I take, you know, it, it moves further away. So then what is the point of utopia? The point is to keep walking, right? So Eduardo Galeano, he's an right. Uruguayan poet. Yeah. It's a wonderful quote. The point is to keep walking, right? right. Exactly. You never get there. Utopia is literally unachievable. Mm -hmm. and, 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 I, and, and, and so when people say, oh, well, that's, you know, good in theory, but it's never going to work in practice. Mm -hmm. I want to turn it around and say, we don't get to think about practical changes we can make without the theories first, mm -hmm. without the wild utopian ideas mm -hmm. that sort of help us. Now, we're never going to get to as far as the utopians want us to go. Mm -hmm. But as we're working in that direction, exactly what Galliano says, as we're walking towards utopia, we're making huge amounts of progress. Mm -hmm. If we look at utopia and we say, oh, that's impossible. Mm -hmm. That's never going to happen. You know, that's too, you know, utopian. That's totally impractical. Then we literally get stuck on the status quo. We get stuck right. on the center. And that is just a recipe for misery and inequality and, anxiety and depression and, 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 and just nothingness, like mm -hmm. nihilistic mm -hmm. nowhereness. And, exactly. and I think that we're stuck in this sort of languishing phase and we need radical social dreams. This is a moment for radical social dreams. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. And you point out that, um, you know, very often, right, like the people in power will feed us dystopian stories actually about, um, you know, don't try for utopia because not only will it never happen, it'll be terrible. It'll, it'll, it won't be what you think, right? So um, you bring up like Animal Farm and 1984 and all these things, right? It's like, don't dream, don't try, just stay where you are um, and just accept the suffering that you know, right? Um, so yeah, I think it's so important. And um, just as a critical theorist myself, I know that it's, it's so so much easier and more comfortable to criticize other people's ideas than it is to, you know, have the courage to come up with ideas yourself and to have those then debated and criticized. Um, but I, I love how you pointed out that it's not like we necessarily have to reinvent the wheel in every case, right? Because we have 2000 years of, of human experiments with living differently. So it's about thinking about how to apply, you know, old good ideas in new ways, or perhaps, you know, in ways relevant to our current time and our current uh, material conditions, right? So again, just... Yeah, yeah I mean, <laughs> exactly. So so there, you know, the, this first point is these dystopian books, like 1984, like Animal Farm, like Brave New World, like Lois Lowry's The Giver, which is often a book that's taught to younger children. These are, and then if you think about like The Hunger Games or Parasite or Squid Game or um, Black Mirror, you know, there are these yeah. like ways in which our popular culture is saturated with these dystopian visions of the future. And part of what those dystopian visions do is make us afraid to pursue change. Mm -hmm. So behavioral economists and psychologists have identified this thing called status quo bias, right? Which is that human beings quite sort of naturally, psychologically, we don't like to feel regret. Regret mm -hmm. is an emotion that we avoid. And we can show empirically in study after study that people feel more regret about a decision that they made that went wrong than about an outcome that resulted from inaction. 
Mm. So we are much, we're sort of wired to be inactive if we fear that something bad is going to happen and that we'll regret our action. And, and, and that is a disciplining tool. That's a disciplining ideological tool that really pervades contemporary late capitalist society in my mm -hmm. view. And mm -hmm. so one of the things that we have to do, and one of the things that I think really became important to me as a thinker and as you know, somebody who was just sort of really diving deep into this history during the pandemic was flexing our cognitive capacity for hope as a way of imagining a new world and enacting that world sort of prefiguratively in our own lives. Mm -hmm. And as you just pointed out, we don't need to just invent the wheel, reinvent right. the wheel. We don't have to come up with these things out of a whole cloth. We literally have 2,005 years, 2,500 years of experiments, of, mm -hmm. of, of role models, cross-culturally, trans-historically, everywhere you look in the historical record, there are these you know, I like to call them the utopian 1%, right? There's this 1% of the population that is just deciding that they're going to do something completely different. Mm -hmm. And it is from that 1% that the rest of the population starts to get new ideas and con conceptions about what it's like to live in the world, particularly as we imagine what our families and societies and communities look like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so you note in the book, and you noted earlier that throughout the world's socialist experiments, uh, the realms of production and exchange were largely reimagined, re but the patriarchal family unit was left intact. So I'm wondering if you could speak to the ways that nuclear heterosexual family units living in single family dwellings work to maintain the capitalist and patriarchal status quo. Yeah. Okay. So, so this is, you know, this is really the meat of the book. And mm -hmm. I spend a lot of time really kind of going through every single piece of this. So the book starts with sort of housing. We talk about childcare, we talk about education, and then we talk about property, and then we talk about the family and sort of the key intervention. And I would say this is again, building on hundreds of years of sort of socialist feminist and other types of, you know, anarchist or women's activist theory. Um, is this idea that the heterosexual nuclear family where two parents provide biparental care for their own biological children in their own single family home surrounded by hordes of their own privately owned stuff, right? <laughs> this is the core unit that makes capitalism what it is today. Mm -hmm. And that if you try to change the polity and the economy without actually dealing with the structure of the family, nothing is really going to change because this family is the unit in society through which we achieve the intergenerational transfer of wealth and privilege. Mm -hmm. And so you have to trouble this unit in order to understand like this whole system, inequality as a concept, right? It emerges out of a particular patriarchal society, patriarchal structures. And I break down um, patriarchy, I think we talked about this on the podcast between patrilineality and patrilocality. There are these very, very specific technologies about how patriarchy works in our daily lives. And in order to really challenge this sort of patriarchal capitalist, and I would add in, in many respects, white supremacist structures in our society, you really have to understand that the family plays a very important role in upholding those structures. Mm -hmm. And so the, the thing that I really want to drill down on is how much an aberration the heterosexual nuclear family with biparental exclusive care for biological children in a single family home surrounded by your own private stuff. What an aberration that is, mm -hmm. right? That we, when we look out across history, when we look to different societies, different historical moments, different society, different um, communities that decided to live differently, what we find is that there are all these different ways of organizing our private lives. But these other ways of organizing our private lives generally tend to lead to more egalitarian outcomes. When we raise our children in common, when they're not necessarily our biological children, when we have broader kinship networks, when we're living more communally, when we are raising you know, our children more communally, when we're sharing our things, not only does this you know, have the, the, the wonderful sort of outcome that it also reduces our carbon footprint, mm -hmm. but it really does start to challenge the fundamental structures in our society that underpin this incredible amount of inequality. Mm -hmm. So that patriarchy and capitalism 
are uniquely intertwined because capitalism requires a certain social acceptance of inequality. And this is uh, Thomas Piketty's work is really important on this point. Mm -hmm. You know, every social system has to justify its inequality in a particular way. And the patriarchal nuclear family based on patrilocality and patrilineality are the sort of fundamental building blocks of our contemporary conception of capitalism. Now, that doesn't mean that capitalism wouldn't thrive without it. It, it can, capitalism is very creative, as is patriarchy. Mm -hmm. um, and Angela Saini has this wonderful new book called The Patriarchs, The Origins of Inequality, which really goes through and shows you all of these other examples of matrilineal and matrilocal societies that thrived and had different sorts of outcomes. But for us, living in you know North America in sort of what we would consider kind of late stage capitalism, I would say that the, the, the patriarchal nuclear family, this particular constellation of the way we organize our private lives, not only does it uphold these you know negative structures that I've identified, but it also makes us very lonely and isolated mm -hmm. from each other. Mm -hmm. It's also very taxing on the planet because it requires higher levels of consumption and yes. it mitigates against sort of what I would call like radical sharing. Mm -hmm. And um, it's it, it also, it's like feeds and promotes even more extreme forms of inequality. So mm -hmm. there's all these different things that would change, I would argue for the better, if we were to re-examine this fundamental unit of our societies. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. And you point out several ways that, um, you know, this harms people of all genders, right? But that a lot of the burden obviously falls on um, women and heterosexual uh, nuclear family units and that capitalism really runs on the unpaid labor of mothers and, and everything. So yeah, it's just, you're right. It's uh, it's something that we really need to examine. Um, and so I love in the book, you use the term family expansionism to talk about moving away from this paradigm instead of family abolition or abolishing the family, um, which I agree is confusing and um, probably very unappealing to most people. Um, but as a new mom myself, I can very much appreciate the need to radically expand this institution. Um, so could you talk about the many ways that one could practice family expansionism? And I guess you already kind of touched on the importance of expanding our family, but if you have any more thoughts on that. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I, as a new mom, I mean, again, like, congratulations. <laughs> yeah, thank also, you, you know, I, I feel you. I know yeah. how hard it is, right? Yeah. My, you know, my own daughter is, is now an adult, but I remember those years very, very well. And mm -hmm. it is it is wonderful and exciting and fulfilling, but it can also be incredibly draining and taxing mm -hmm. and time consuming, right? Mm -hmm. So, so parenthood is this, um, is this, is this really valuable thing to us, right? For as a lot of us, um, especially those of us I think who are parents, right? We we tend to see that there are some upsides, right? Mm -hmm. but, but, but there are these really important social benefits, right? Um, the economist Nancy Fulber have, has talked about children as being public goods, right? When we bring children into the world, they're future taxpayers, they're future consumers and workers, and you know, in some cases they're soldiers. And so everybody who's alive in a particular society benefits from the unpaid labor that parents do to bring children into the world. And especially I think during the pandemic, many people who had young children were absolutely crushed by the responsibilities of taking care of young children. And, mm -hmm. and it became very clear how our societies really depend on this unpaid labor that mm -hmm. caregivers do. Now, in, in most cases, it's primarily mothers, but it doesn't have to be, right? It's people of all genders who have primary caregiving roles. So. The reason I like the term family expansionism is, because, I, as I say in the book, I think there's there's a way in which people, and I would say, I think especially people in immigrant communities or people of color for whom the family is a place of great safety and support mm -hmm. in an otherwise very hostile society. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I also, I understand really profoundly how defensive people get around any discussion of abolishing the family, right? Mm -hmm. Or challenging the primacy of the family when people, you know, especially people who are also lower on the socioeconomic ladder, their family mm -hmm. supports are extremely important to their ability to survive and thrive in our very, very, very competitive societies. But expansionism, right, allows us to imagine what 
anthropologists would call non-consanguineous kin. So we have this idea of consanguineous kin. These are the people that we're technically blood related to. Mm -hmm. We create these blood relations also through these legal, um, you know, we get married and things like that, and we create legal kin. But there are all these other very expansive ways of imagining the family. And so one of the things I talk about in the book is like godparents, right? Mm -hmm. Many religious traditions have the concept of godparenting, where, you know, the couple maybe has couple friends um, or, you know, mentors who become sort of like surrogate parents for the child. You know, we also have fictive kin, like aunties and uncles, like your college buddies or whatever, people that are in your life who are really important other significant adults in the lives of your children. And so one of the things that, and, 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 and then aside from the child rearing aspect of this, there's also like, even if we are in pair bonded relationships with one other person, and these can you know, run the gamut, you know, you can have a, um, like a celibate pair bond, you know, we know that humans pair bond, even if they're not necessarily quote unquote mating. Again, I use anthropological terms because these are the terms <laughs> that we use. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's not necessarily it has to be a sexual relationship. You can have a, a, mm -hmm. a platonic pair bond, mm -hmm. you can have a, a monogamous pair bond, you can have heterosexual pair bond, homosexual pair bond. You know, you can, there are all sorts of permutations of these pair bonds. You could actually be within a group marriage. You could be um, practicing poly polyamory, but still have a primary emotional pair bond. Mm -hmm. And what I say in the book is that we should detach our mating practices, the way that we meet our romantic needs, uh, from our childbearing practices, because human beings are historically and evolutionarily cooperative breeders. And there's a there's a very good historical record and anthropological record to show that exclusive biparental care is maybe somewhat a late evolutionary adaption. And that, mm -hmm. again, human families are incredibly flexible and creative and adaptive depending on the circumstances that they find themselves in. Mm -hmm. And so when I talk about family expansionism, what I want people to look at is, is, is like spend more time with your couple other friends outside of your primary <laughs> relationship. Allow your children to spend more time with their godparents or with your, you know, um, your, your family friends, your, your fictive kin, with your parents. <laughs> Grandparents can also be part of this expanded family network. Older <laughs> siblings, cousins, but it can also be, you know, neighbors. It can be comrades. It could be colleagues. Like we have to have a much more capacious view of family. And once we begin to develop this more capacious view of family, all sorts of other things will follow from that, which I've already enumerated in our in the previous uh, discussion. But I think that we need to understand that this particular constellation of you know two, you know, in most cases, I think um, the, the standard trope is a heterosexual couple providing mm -hmm. primarily biparental care to their own biological children. This is not necessarily the quote unquote natural way of doing things. We've mm -hmm. just reified it so that it's very difficult for us to see alternatives. Absolutely, yeah. I just wanna highlight uh, T.H. Woth says, becoming a parent has been the most radicalizing experience of my life. Um, and I would agree because I remember um, just especially at the starting. So I'm someone who um, like I've, I've had longstanding chronic illness and so sleep is very important to me. And so obviously at the beginning when sleep was like, it's like every couple of hours, right? Um, I just kept thinking like, how, how does this make evolutionary sense? Like, how would it be evolutionarily advantageous for a birthing person to go through nine months of this like intense change to their body and then an extremely, you know, uh, exhausting birthing process and then have to be up every two hours, day and night, nursing a child? Like, how would that make any evolutionary sense? Um, and I was mad about it. Um, but then I realized it's because it was never meant to be this way. It was never meant to be just one one per person and their baby and just like up all the time, you know, just doing that because it would have been a community. And I think that's part of why that is evolutionarily advantageous because it necessitates the building of communities, which is what has allowed humans to thrive in the world. Right. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I just think expansion is is just absolutely necessary. Right. Um, yeah. And if you know, if you want to dig into this, there's a wonderful yeah. <laughs> book by um, Hardy, H-R-D-Y. I think it's called Mothers and Others. And and she's also published. A, a, she's an evolutionary anthropologist and she's in a lot of really interesting work around 
cooperative breeding, you know, this idea that we raised our children collectively. And, you know, she even goes so far as to argue, I mean, people disagree with her, but it's a really compelling and interesting hypothesis that like unique product of cooperative breeding, I think I mentioned this in the book, right? Like human cognition, language, the sort of social skills that we have come from our history of cooperative breeding. So what makes humans human is this idea that we raised our young collectively because there are certainly, there are certain weird things about human babies. Like our babies are basically born premature. Mm -hmm. So they require a lot of provisioning. Um, we tend to have babies in rapid succession, like, you know, um, other higher primates, they don't have, they don't get pregnant again until their children are pretty much independent. Mm -hmm. So humans, because we tend to have these children in rapid succession, it's very, very difficult to provision, just to, to provide the number of calories necessary to keep that baby alive mm -hmm. by yourself, right? right. Um, yeah. You require help. Mm -hmm. And yes, the help could be the other biological parent, but it can also be older siblings. It could be grandmothers. It could mm -hmm. be kin, other sorts of kin. It can be non-kin. I mean, Again, when you look around the world, there's this remarkable diversity. One of my favorite examples of this is that like human family forms from the anthropological record, from the archaeological record, we can, we can start to understand, right, ethnographically, cross-culturally, that when human beings live in different climatic or geographic conditions, their family forms change. So there are these villages very, very high up in the Himalayas where you have... Um, very resource poor areas. And so they, they're, they're kind of hostile to human life. And it turns out that one of the family adaptations, the cultural adaptations is polyandry. So you have one woman with multiple husbands. Mm. Now, why would that be evolutionarily adaptive in those climactic circumstances? Because it is a natural form of birth control. Fewer babies are going to be born if you have just one woman who has multiple husbands. Mm -hmm. so, so human beings, like human families, are they're so diverse and they're so flexible and adaptable. And let's face it, why is this important right now? The family form that we have is adapted to a model of the planet where we thought of resources as abundant and extractable and kind mm -hmm. of endlessly extractable. Mm -hmm. And then we created this economic model that is predicated on this resource extraction that somehow justifies inequality because inequality is the driver of quote unquote progress and development and all those things. Mm -hmm. And so the family form that we have is predicated on a particular economic model that is predicated on a specific relationship to the planet and a specific set of geographic and climactic um, circumstances. Mm -hmm. So as the climate changes, as resources become not so abundant, right? Mm -hmm. As we're you know, living through various heat waves right now as we speak, we have to go back to the drawing board on our family and say, okay, circumstances have changed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We need much different and much more capacious definitions of kin and of family mm -hmm. than we had in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. And that's, I don't think that's, I mean, I realize that to a lot of people that sounds really radical, <laughs> but it's not that radical because it's how we have been raising children in mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. world on this planet for thousands of years. Absolutely. And parenthood, you know, um, I just got contacted um, by some people who are doing a documentary on birth strike the birth strike, oh, you know, this idea yeah. of not having children, right? Mm -hmm. and, 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 I, and while I'm very respectful of people who don't want to have children, mm -hmm. I, I like the comment that you just read, I think that having a child can be one of the most radical things, yes. radicalizing things that you can do if you decide to bring that child into the world differently than the way mm -hmm. everybody else wants you to do it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so well said. And um, I love that you tied that also to, uh, you know, climatic issues and geography, because I think a lot of people don't necessarily would make that immediate connection. Um, but that's really important. Um, so I want to tie that into the next question. But I just wanted to note also that um, in your book, you talk about being an introvert. And because a lot of the experiments you talk about are very, you know, everyone's living communally sharing and things like that. And that, you know, that could be challenging for an introvert. Um, and just on the, you know, 
children being radicalizing, I have always been a mega, mega introvert. And I've always felt like I needed so much time by myself. And um, I was kind of concerned about what, what, what it would be like to have a child. Um, and then having a child honestly just completely flipped that. Like we're going camping this weekend, for example. And before I would love to just do that alone or like just with you know a very few people and now i'm honestly just like who else can we invite like let's invite everyone <laughs> like we, we need we need everyone on this trip because yeah like it, it does take a village right so just completely yeah. agree on the radicalizing nature of, of potentially of having children um so uh my next question is uh and I, I think most people watching this stream will be in agreement but could you also outline the need for alternative education and then you've already kind of touched on this but you know the the importance of creating a true sharing economy um and moving away from private property so we can minimize the number of goods that we create and waste yeah i mean and the and the waste here i think is a, is a big major subtext of the book so on the one hand i you know i am really talking about this idea of expanding our families and living in these greater communities where we are you know, connected and supported and validated by greater numbers of people. And part of the reason that I think that's really important is because it then freights our relationships with our primary significant others and with our children, um, it, it, it unburdens those relationships. Like if you take our relationships and you sink them into a sea of other people, right? They may not necessarily be your primary pair bond, or they might necessarily, not necessarily be your primary, you know, your biological child. And, I, and I'm not saying that you shouldn't love your biological children, right? And some <laughs> people misinterpret that. But what I'm saying is, is if you have, if your kids have other adults in their lives, if you have other friends, lateral relationships, if you're connected to more people, then the emotional demands that a child makes on its parent or that a partner makes on its partner or its, you know, constellation of partners, those are going to be reduced. And so all of our relationships are going to be just much happier. Now, the reason that this is so difficult to do is because of education. On some level, we live in a world and we are, you know, given these curricula and we read these books that basically say that these social experiments of reimagining our private lives are going to lead to this terrible, horrible dystopia. Mm -hmm. And the key way that they do that is by sort of preying on a very fundamental human fear that we will be unloved and alone. And I think that you have to respect that everybody wants to be loved and wants to have community. Now, I'm like you, I, I need my alone time yeah, and I yeah. need my room, right? <laughs> yeah. I need my place to write and I need my place to work. And so for me, that's always been a negotiation of like, you know, there are people in my life and I love them, but sometimes I just need my space. Mm -hmm. But but we've been sort of sold an ideology that is reinforced, I think, in our schools where we reify competition over cooperation. Um, we think about, we constantly give up community for convenience, right? Um, we are really sort of idolizing people who are selfish and individualist rather than those who are cooperative and helpful and um, per 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 perhaps just like altruistic, mm -hmm. right? So our schools and the curricula of our schools play a really big role in this. And mm -hmm. it, it also plays a big role in dividing us into manual and mental laborers, which, uh, mm -hmm. sorry, manual and mental laborers, which mm -hmm. I talk a lot about in the book. I give some mm -hmm. really concrete examples of, of different programs that try to blur the boundaries between mental laborers and manual laborers and why that's so important. Mm -hmm. And I also think that, you know, schools are a place, unfortunately, right now, where children who are very creative and very utopian and hopeful and optimistic and daydreaming about different worlds, schools kind of crush that out of us. Mm -hmm. And I think that schools, and I say this as an educator, by the way, I think that schools should be the place where, it, where we are encouraged to dream where we're really encouraged to think outside the box, where we're really like supported to be, you know, as, as wildly dreaming about alternatives in the future as possible. And unfortunately that's not what happens. We mm -hmm. get boxed in and, and, and sort of told to conform and meet certain kinds of expectations about our behaviors and following orders and meeting deadlines and working well in a group to be productive in certain ways. I mean, it's, it's, it's a very frustrating reality. Uh, education has become another institution, which I think 
allows for the intergenerational transfer of wealth and privilege. And so it's another node in this reconfiguration of the private sphere that needs to be addressed if mm-hmm. we're going to actually rethink the way we are defining our families and, and mm-hmm. living in the world and then ultimately how we relate to our property, mm-hmm. right? Because these individual family units become containers for property. And first of all, it multi- if our families are smaller, it multiplies the amount of property that needs to be owned, right? So mm-hmm. we all have our own washers and dryers and lawnmowers and refrigerators, and especially these major appri- appliances, which have you know planned obsolescent lifespans of about a decade or so, mm-hmm. they just end up in land fo- landfill, right? And I mean, you know, yeah. and if you live in the Northeast, if you live anywhere where there's snow, right? Snow blowers are another great thing that are really expensive. Like, why does every bloody family need their own snow blower? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Easily share, right? right. Yeah. Um, but how many of us are willing to like knock on our neighbor's door or you know yeah. two neighbors and say, "Hey, you guys want to go in on a snowblower with me?" Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You could do this, but so so there's this incredible way in which the family justifies a particular amount of property that yes. needs to be owned and maintained. And if we're going to try to reduce, really seriously, for 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 climate crisis reasons, we need to reduce just mm-hmm. the amount of sheer stuff that is getting mm-hmm. produced and is getting thrown away and is ending up in landfills. That means that we kind of need to share our stuff with a lot more people. Now, a lot of people are like, oh my God, but that's just like communism. And people get really upset about <laughs> this idea. And I'm like, but wait a minute, we have like Zipcar. Yes. And we have like Rent the Runway. And we have these like websites in the quote unquote sharing economy, which unfortunately they are now being you know, mitigated by for-profit companies. Sure. But we already kind of understand we have these bike sharing, you know, where I am in, in Germany right now, it's called Frello is the bike sharing. Um, they're everywhere. And those stupid Lime scooters, right? You just yeah. put your phone and then you can take a scooter or a bicycle wherever you need to go and then you just drop it off. Mm-hmm. And so I don't own a bike. I don't own a scooter. I don't need to have my own because I'm sharing it with a bunch of other people who happen to live in this city. like. It, and that, that is a very capitalist idea, not necessarily a socialist one, right? But the mm-hmm. underlying principle is that I don't need all this stuff, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. We can live in a sharing, we can live in these more capacious communities with wider networks of lateral support and care. And that will necessarily allow us to share our things with a wider group of people, which will ultimately reduce the number of things that need to be produced, bought, and then thrown Mm. away. Absolutely. Absolutely. And if you don't have to buy so many things, then you don't have to hustle. So, you know, get up and rise and grind at the, you know, uh, for wage labor or whatever, right? Like you can think about reducing the amount, you know, you can think about three day work weeks, four day work weeks, and actually like reducing the amount that we all have to labor to purchase things that we don't need and that are just going to be wasted anyway and that are destroying the planet. So, exactly. Um, yeah. well, and, then, and, then, and then one step <laughs> beyond that, right, mm-hmm. is that I think that's absolutely a great point, right, that we would mm-hmm. we work less hard, which is another reason why people don't like this idea, yes. right? Yeah. We, would have, we would have more personal freedom mm-hmm. because we wouldn't be chasing, right, uh, all mm-hmm. of these material goods that you know, that people are now convinced that they need, like, you know, private cars are a big expense, right? If we had car collectives, you know, if if there was just like one big zip car for the entire, you know, or whatever, you know what I mean? Like a, like a car sharing situation where you Mm -hmm. could get a car whenever you needed it. Um, I mean, auto manufacturers would hate this idea, right? Because we would all not be having these private cars. But here's the Mm -hmm. other thing that's related to this is that a lot of us, and I include myself in this, we buy things when we feel lonely mm. and we feel unsupported. Like we, the instant gratification of consumerism is often a way that we fill the hole of disconnectedness in our lives. Mm-hmm. So I know I, how many of you have been out there, like, you know, feeling anxious at like, you know, one o'clock in the morning and you're on amazon.com shopping for something just because it will make <laughs> you feel a little bit better, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so there's this way, if we had much more emotional support, and we really felt loved and connected, right? We would 
probably buy less stuff as well. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so because advertisers understand this desire, mm -hmm. this, this fear that like, if I buy, you know, this cute jacket or whatever, people mm -hmm. are going to like me. Right. Um, I might, you know, somebody might, you know, love me even. And, and so mm -hmm. the, the, the promise of consumerism is ultimately this human connection. Mm -hmm. And what I'm saying is if we got the human connection, we might yes. not need the consumerism as much. So Absolutely. It's also this, this, there's a second order kind mm -hmm. of um, value to living in more capacious and less competitive societies. Mm, yeah, I absolutely love that. Um, TH Wath again says, Dr. Gatsi is talking about library socialism, um, which is seriously wrong, has come up with this idea of library socialism, basically that everything should just be run like through libraries, which absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, my daughter, when my daughter was little, I think she was like six or seven. I can't even remember. Um, and it's funny because I was just talking to her about this because the Barbie movie is coming out and, you yeah. know, she was a, bar a Barbie, you know, as many young girls is like, you can't prevent this, like, but she wanted Barbie libraries. Like mm. she thought that like, there were all these, you know, basically plastic things that you were yeah. supposed to buy, like the dream house and the car and the whatever. I don't even remember what they all were, but that there should be libraries so that you mm -hmm. can like take some things out, play with them for a little while and then return them. And then everybody yes. can share. Yes. Like, you know, this was like a very natural six-year-old way of organizing, you know, the Barbie world, but, right. but she, you know, and, and people talk about tool libraries um, and, you know, there, there are appliance libraries. I do think that there's, you know, the, again, it's not as radical because we understand what book libraries look like. And right. so you could easily organize these things there, you know, mm -hmm. and there are models. There are really great models for this. You know, if, and if we go back to the Soviet Union and we talk about like Kalantai and the public laundries and, 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 and ca cafeterias and canteens, there are all these ways in which we could socialize huge parts of the affective labor and the and the and the care work that is done to raise children mm -hmm. that would also increase the collective community bonds with other people that would allow for these more expanded networks and ultimately for some kind of cooperative breeding to be sort mm -hmm. of the norm in our societies rather than this sort of biparental model in our own homes where we hoard our, hoard our own private stuff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think a lot of people are unsatisfied with that model, but that is the model that we are always being sold as the ideal and we have Absolutely. to push back against it. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, even, like, you know, it's like we have to pay for childcare, right? Even just socializing ch like childcare, right? That would go a long way. Um, so I do want to move on. I did, I did want to mention just uh, read the education piece that education can often also reinforce nationalism, which you brought up with the Pledge of Allegiance and things like that. And then, and teaches kind of false histories about settler colonialism and, and whatnot. Um, and I do credit education, formal education for like destroying my creativity. Not that it's been totally destroyed, but I, I feel like as a child, I was just very, very creative. And then going through schooling and especially graduate schooling where everything had to be just so um it's yeah it's it's really kind of dampened my ability to have the courage to to dream right so just with you on that um so in the book you outline numerous examples of people coming together and living differently and that's what i really love the most about the book because i just love that that real you know uh, story, right? It's, it's, it's like the opposite of true crime, like true hope, true liberation. You know, I just love that. Um, so we obviously can't go through every single experiment, but I'm wondering which ones um, stood out most to you as particularly intriguing or exciting. Oh God. Yeah. So, I mean, the book that, that was the greatest pleasure of writing this book was going in through all of these different experiments and, and how they worked. And so, you know, I think the, there, you know, I, there are a lot of them. So I encourage people, if you're interested in these, you know, to, to dig in and like really have fun with them because they're just, they're wild. Some of them are really wild. I think, you know, a couple of the ones that were the most fun for me to research was the Pythagorean commune in Croton mm -hmm. um, about 2,500 years ago, right? So everybody knows the Pythagorean theorem, but they don't realize that Pythagoras was sort of a communist and a proto-feminist. Uh, and he basically lived in this commune. He left, you know, mainstream uh, Greek society to kind of create this commune where everybody owned their property in common and women had equal rights to like study mathematics and the mysteries of the universe or whatever. Um, and then, you know, I spent a lot of time looking at uh, Benedictine cloisters, like these early Benedictine cloisters. And there's a contemporary, actually only about 
four hours from where I am by public transportation, a community of experimental archaeologists, which are building, it's called Campus Gowley, and they're building the 1820 to 18, sorry, 820 to 830, this is the 9th century, plan of St. Gall, and they're doing it with the methods and the materials of the Middle Ages. And this is a community of people that are really coming together and trying to live the rule of St. Benedict. So it's a, it's a secular community, but it's got this really interesting sort of Middle Ages underpinning that is about how to live together in community with a bunch of people that you aren't related to, mm -hmm. which I think is really fascinating, especially because Christianity has been one of, especially Catholicism, has been one of the institutions in society, in society that has most doubled down on kind of the monogamous nuclear family and sort of pushed that out through colonialism, particularly settler, settler colonialism. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that I love that example, these these uh, Campus Galley uh, experimental archaeologists. You know, there there's the Oneida community in upstate New York. They practice group marriage and community child rearing. Uh, there are many examples from Eastern Europe. There are these begging nuns in the low country. So so there are lots of really fascinating examples of these communities. I think you know, some people think that they were very short-lived. Some of them, like the social palace in Guise, France, this was a follower of a guy called Charles Fourier, and uh, they existed for 109 years. They lived in this sort of big communal kind of like hotel. And um, I don't know, I mean, there, there's just a lot of really interesting examples. And, you know, I talk about architecture, I talk about co-housing and co-living, and I talk about you know, different ways of, in Germany, there are these things called Baugruppen. Um, one of the uh, neighborhoods where I, I'm in Freiburg, Germany right now, and there's a neighborhood here, which was an old military base that the French abandoned in 1991 or 1992. And then it was settled by squatters. Mm. And the squatters, of, you know, a lot of them kind of hippies, but there were a couple of architects among them. And they kind of created this really fascinating community. Mm. And it still exists to this day. And I'm actually mm. going to go out there this weekend and talk to some of them. So, so cool. all around the world, there are all these different little examples of people living different ways. And mm. I think that these that it's not enough to just read fiction, right? Which is what a lot of people in utopian studies do. They look at these fictional worlds and, you know, science fiction or science fiction, uh, science fiction films or science fiction books. And there's some great stuff there, don't get me wrong. But I also think it's really important to remember that there are really existing communities, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I talked about the early Cenobitic monastic followers of the Buddha or the Essenes who existed between the second century, um, you know, BC and first century AD in, um, you know, the Middle East. And these were property, uh, collective property owning people who didn't believe in money and didn't believe in slavery in antiquity, right? And of course, you know, got rid of them. But but there, they, there were all these communities. And, and I think it's so important for us to remember that mm -hmm. they were there and they existed and we can take inspiration from them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. The Pythagorean uh, commune was complete news to me, right? Like, yeah, I know the Pythagorean theorem, but I, I didn't know anything about that. Um, one that stood up to me, and you you included this in your introduction. I'm just going to uh, read this. It's the the Mosuo. Um, and it's a community of Tibetan Buddhists that is matrilocal. Um, grandmothers preside over large multi generational families. Men live in their maternal grandmother's household and practice a form of walking marriage, whereby they they visit their partner only at night. Both men and women can have as many partners as they desire without stigma, and women often do not know who has fathered their children. The concept of father barely exists, and rather being a good uncle is very important as men help raise the children of their sisters. Since there is no formal marriage, the only reason that people form pairs is because they are attracted to each other or enjoy each other's company. And when the attraction fades, romantic ties can be dissolved without negative financial consequences or social impacts on the children. And uh, I mean, that just like hit me in the introduction. I was like, oh my God, <laughs> like just because uh, it's, it's just so radically different from you know everything that we practice. Um, and I mean, even just this idea of multi-generational households, I mean, that's really prevalent outside of the West. Um, and again, like having a child, I mean, we moved in with my parents for the first two weeks um, after having my child, because it was like, I mean, we just needed to, um, but thank God we could. Um, 
And it just made me realize that, you know, there are so many cultures where multi-generational families is the norm. Um, but here we are, and you, you point this out, that here there are actually so many places where we enact laws to prevent that many people from living in the same home, um, which is absolutely absurd, right? And it's, it's, it's considered, you know, um, less than, it's, it's uncivilized to do that, which is, uh, you know, ridiculous. It's, I think it's the only civilized, insane way to raise a child, right? Um, so anyway, I just, I thought that was a really, um, something that really stood up to me. Um, so I'm wondering, uh, this is a big question, but you know, what do you hope that people most take away from the book? So, I, you know, it is a big question. Yeah. And <laughs> part of it is, is I think it is the, this, um, you know, I end the book. So I, you know, I go through all of these different constituent components of this sort of model that we've been sold. So housing and childcare and education and property and the family, our definition of the family. But then I end with a chapter called the Star Trek game plan, right? How radical hope defeats dystopian despair. And mm -hmm. so, so the one thing that I really, and, and this is a little bit atypical for me. I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I am a critical theorist and, and a lot of my academic books have been like really, you know, digging in and talking about the despair, yeah. uh, especially of, of, of people, you know, who were promised a certain bill of goods after the fall of communism with the coming of free markets and, and democracy. And they did not get that, what they thought they were going to get. And, you know, all of the dislocations and the pain and, and, and everything. So, so it's not like I'm somebody who is typically writing in this vein. I tend to be a pretty critical person, but now, and I'm not sure what happened. I think part of it was the product of the pandemic, but it, part of it was a problem, a, a product, sorry, part of this was a product of me reading all these utopian texts and reading about all these utopian communities. And I started thinking about, you know, the work of Ernst Bloch and Karl Mannheim, these are two German social theorists who really talk about the politics of hope, the politics of optimism. And there's also a school uh, in psychology that talks about hope as a cognitive capacity. So mm -hmm. hope is to the future what memory is to the past. So you have a good memory if you can recall events or if you can memorize a bunch of facts and regurgitate them on an exam. This is what a lot of education is about, right? And we understand that you can like strengthen your memory. You can do like little memory exercises, right? Like not keep your grocery list on your phone, but try to keep it in your head or memorize people's phone numbers. Or there are all these ways that you can do like memory training. Well, hope as a cognitive capacity. So there, hope is also an emotion, the reverse of which is hopelessness. But hope as a cognitive capacity is the ability to imagine a future and to figure out different pathways of how to get to that future and how to overcome the inevitable obstacles and challenges that you're going to face on the way to that future. Now, in um, psychology, this is often taught at an individual level. So people do things like hope training or hope journaling or, you know, there's like mental imaging. There's like there's all these techniques that to help you sort of strengthen this muscle of hope in order to like function better in society. And what I want to say is I think that we could hope collectively, mm -hmm. that we should hope together every day out loud in community. And that that flexing that cognitive capacity for hope together with others is the way that we make the future that we want to make. So mm -hmm. A, we're not trapped in the present and B, the people who we want to believe are in control of our lives are actually not in control of our lives. We're in control of our lives. And the more we realize that we can flex this cognitive capacity for hope to build the future that we want, the more we actually start to increase our capacity to build it. Mm -hmm. And so it's like this kind of uh, virtuous cycle. And I really want people to leave this book with two messages. One, which is, hey, it's not... Um, they're like, the world has been shitty for a really long time. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't know if I'm allowed to swear, but like, it's, no, that's uh, fine. <laughs> it's always been fucked up. Right. Yeah. And, um, and, and, but there've always been people trying to figure out how to make it better. Yes. And, and second of all, that sometimes the most important intervention point to make it better is in our immediate families and communities and mm -hmm. our collective lateral relationships. So yes, it's important to be on the front lines fighting against the powers that be. Yes, mm -hmm. it's important to be doing critical intellectual work and, and, and writing and, and thinking and podcasting and live streaming and all the things that we do. But 
in our relationships with our friends, with our partners, with our children, with our parents, with our wider lateral networks, we are also enacting politics. We are also able to change the world from below. And mm -hmm. I think that's a message that a lot of people forget. That, mm -hmm. that, that, you know, hanging out with your best friends or going camping with a bunch of people over <laughs> the weekend is political work. It mm -hmm. is really important political work. And we need to attend to it and care for it and expand it as much as possible. Mm -hmm. oh, I, I just I love everything that you've just said. And I've taken so, so much from this book. So I really recommend to everyone to pick this up and give it a read. Um, so we have about, you know, five minutes or so uh, uh for the hour. So I think we can start taking some questions. I just want to mention that Calpic says hope is a skill. Absolutely. Um, so this is a great question um, by TH Woth. Um, I wonder if Dr. Godsey thinks that experiments like the Paris Commune still offers a radical beacon of hope and how we can experiment with our ways of living within our current sociopolitical context. Yeah. I mean, so the answer is just yes. Any <laughs> any attempt right to live a kind of prefigurative politics any attempt for people when they come together and they start radically rethinking the way that they're going to organize their lives is a great example for us to follow always mm -hmm. you know and and i mean the paris commune is a great one it's obviously been written about by a lot of people but but there are others that people don't know about and mm -hmm. in some ways ones that were more successful because they didn't meet the resistance that the, the Paris Commune met. Now, part of that is because some of these communities sort of go off on their own. So one of the ones I talk about in the book is Twin Oaks, which is a intentional community in rural Virginia that has now existed for more than 50 years and is quite successful. You know, and they have things like community wardrobe and they they live um, in, in, you know, these uh, very different sorts of ways. They're, you know, raising their children sort of much more collectively than you would imagine in mainstream society. So yes, any example where people come together and they prefiguratively begin to live the politics and um, the economies that they want to see, despite the fact that they will inevitably meet resistance, because they always do, <laughs> um, that is, those are really important examples for us to use to help flex this cognitive capacity, this skill of hope. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And you mentioned in the book that there is, um, you know, some critique of people like that who go, kind of go off on their own and some people are like, oh, well, that's just privilege. I mean, you do mention that it's like, well, you know, people coming together and pooling their resources, it's, it's like, that's how you create more collective, uh, you know, wealth and stability. But, you know, there is that, um, that critique there of like, oh, but you're just going out off and leaving everyone else. But I mean, I think we kind of need both, right? Like we need these experiments. We need people kind of building parallel institutions that can then, you know, work to inspire that kind of, uh, outside of these small communities. And then we also need the people who are, are going to be on the front lines, as you said, right? Or what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I mean, I, so so th this is a great example of where I do think this, you know, there's this, I mean, the left can be very sectarian. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't think that's a surprise to anyone, right? So there, yeah. <laughs> there are certainly people who say, like, if you go off and you join a commune, or if you go off and you um, you know, decide to do things differently. So a great example here would be this, this word that has become very popular recently. I think there was an article in the New York Times, the Momunes, oh. where a group <laughs> nice. of like single moms get yeah. together and they buy a house and they raise their children in common, right? And they're not necessarily on the front lines of fighting for universal child care. They're not necessarily on the front lines of, you know, trying to get some sort of equitable pay or, or you know, all the things that really need to happen on this sort of broader social level. They're mm -hmm. just like saying that for their immediate four lives and whatever, however many women come together, um, they're going to like share their expenses because it just helps them Right. And they can share child care and they can share, you know, repairs and cars. And there are ways in which they're pooling resources that are making their lives much easier. So so you could judge them and say, well, they're just retreating from the struggle. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but on the other hand, they're showing us alternatives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I do. Well, I do think that we should make claims and address them to the state. If the state is not responding for whatever set of reasons, if the state is not being responsive or if it's just being, you know, outright regressive and um, 
hostile to us. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that we should just give up and accept the status quo. Mm -hmm. We can start to live in these other ways. Mm -hmm. and, and let's face it, you know, if having young children is really hard and yeah. <laughs> you, can't, you can't be expected to be out there, you know, on the front lines of every protest when you are doing mm -hmm. all this care work. That's why mm -hmm. I'm saying we need to politicize the care work too. Right. We need to recognize that doing the kind of care and the way that we do it in and of itself is contributing to this broader political Mm -hmm. movement towards making our societies much, you know, to expanding the social safety nets, but also creating our own social safety nets, right? It's mm -hmm. not just that we're waiting for gifts from the mm -hmm. state. We're also mm -hmm. creating prefiguratively the societies in which mm -hmm. we want to live. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. I love the term mom, mom you. Mom you, I know. It's a great term. Mom <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just heard the, the term mom rad. I actually did a podcast about becoming a mom rad. So <laughs> if you yeah, want mom to rad. Yeah, no, just, yeah. There's, there's so many, so many great ways. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so James Buchanan says, did you examine the role of state agents in, disru in disrupting these communities? Yes. <laughs> <sighs> I mean, this was, this was, a, you know, an un unfortunate, um, consistent theme is the ways in which state agents, but also just, I would say the powers that be, right? Because if we go back to antiquity, we're talking about the Roman empire crushing the Essenes or, you know, a very early example of a utopian community would be um, pre-325 Christians, right? Who often lived together in communes and owned all their property in common. Um, now, Christians, unlike um, other groups, you know, celibacy, many early Christians practiced celibacy, which was I th I'm pretty sure it was illegal in the Roman Empire, right? You were required to be married and have children. Wow. So, so celibacy was was only allowed, I believe, for um, vestal virgin virgins and then um, the eunuch priests of the cult of Sibylle or something like that. Um, but in antiquity, celibacy was almost unheard of. So when the Christ these early Christians were not only owning their property and they were owning their property in common. And that's very clear in Acts. You can go read those sections of the Bible if you want, if you don't believe me. Um, but but they were, they were, you know, really radical, these, these early pre-25 Christians, because they were also practicing celibacy, which meant they weren't having children. And, and there's a long history of radical Christian celibate sex, sects, mm -hmm. you know, um, that 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 of course the church did everything possible. Like first the Roman empire and then later the mainstream churches did absolutely everything possible to eradicate. Mm -hmm. So if we look at the 13th century and the Albigensian crusade against the Cathars in, in Southern France and Northern Italy, these, these were the first victims of the um, inquisition. These were people who basically believed in gender equality uh, because they did, they believed that the spirit was sexless. This is really fascinating. They didn't eat flesh. They didn't believe in wealth. And so they were very critical of the Catholic Church because the Catholic Church wanted all this wealth. And they practiced celibacy. Um, and they were very influential in Southern France. And so, you know, the Catholic Church came and got rid of all of them. And, and I can show you many, many, many examples historically where either states or organized religion infiltrate or oppress or otherwise try to eradicate these communities because these communities are a threat. So, so that's an interesting thing just to, to follow up on that, right? One of the critiques that I often get is, well, these communities are so small, they're not really gonna change anything. Like they're, they're, they're only 1%, they're just there out on the margins. They're living out in the middle of nowhere and they're just doing their own thing and they're withdrawing from society. And so you can't say that and then at the same time recognize that these communities pose such a massive threat mm -hmm. that they need to be crushed constantly and they're constantly mm -hmm. being crushed, right? Mm -hmm. So they obviously, when people get together and start living their lives mm -hmm. in a different way than society wants them to, it does, to the extent that there's, uh, anarchists use this wonderful term that I love, it's called contaminationism, mm -hmm. right? So a bunch of people are sort of living a particular way and then other people go, hey, that's a, that's a good way of doing things, let's do that too. And then somebody else sees it and it starts to spread in this very organic kind of bottom up way mm -hmm. to the extent that states and religions fear that. 
um, they will do everything possible to smash those communities. And, and they often do that by, you know, um, infiltration uh, in the case of, uh, or, or just, you know, direct persecution in the case of the Oneida community in upstate New York, because they practice group marriage. You know, this was the 19th century in the United States and New England. I mean, in, you know, Northern United States, um, they were accused of adultery. Mm. Right. And so the state threatened to come in and take all their children away from them because they were adulterers. So, yeah, there are many, many examples of, of where these utopian communities have faced all sorts of persecution because of their unique ways of reorganizing the domestic sphere. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, absolutely. Um, so should we take one more question? I know it's yeah, a bit sure. After, yeah. A bit after, a bit after the hour, but there's yeah, one okay. more question. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's great. Um, well, there's two people here talking about uh, – the romanticism of community living. One is saying community living sounds very romantic to me, not without challenges, of course, but still a lovely thing. Um, and then M asks, uh, living together several generations, I guess, ago was normal among peasants in Norway until about 50 years ago. And many women wanted to opt out because of oppression from both husbands and in-laws. Can community living be romanticized? Yes. And the answer is that, um, it, you know, nothing is easy, right? I, I, I think that people put an incredible amount of effort into living in these more intentional communities, right? And in fact, I think I, I, a couple of weeks ago, I was on the Ezra Klein show and, and, and Klein asked me specifically about this, like how much effort we would put into living community that we could save to do other things, right? Like getting jobs and building our careers or whatever. Um, and the question is, I think, one of priorities, right? So, so I think that the key thing about the Norwegian example here is that these are patrilineal, patrilocal households where women um, leave their natal kin and move into the families of their husbands and then are under the authority of their in-laws. And, and this is a very common still in many parts of the world, um, in the subcontinent, in Central Asia. You have many, many women who are basically sort of shuttled off uh, as property into their husband's families. And then they are required to basically labor not only for their husbands and for their children, but also for their husband's parents. And in some cases, their husband's extended kin network. Mm -hmm. So I am very specifically talking about examples that are not patrilocal and that are yes, not patrilineal. Yes. And so I think I want to make that very, very clear. I am yes. not romanticizing any sort of extended family network that is still based on patrilocality locality and patrilineality. And I think that's a really important distinction. That being said, right, um, I uh, completely agree that living in community is going to require effort and it's going, it's going to require um, the kind of attention and care to our relationships that some of us may not take at this particular moment in time, because we have like maybe one, maybe two, maybe three primary emotional bonds in our lives. If we, if we, agree, if we read the studies, it turns out that some Americans actually have zero, right? They only have to think about themselves. And I mean, and this is like, um, this is contributing to this pandemic of loneliness and isolation that a lot of, you know, there have been all these studies. I don't know if you've I don't know if you've if you've read all these studies about how like being alone is like smoking fifteen cigarettes mm. a day. Studies, right? I've heard about them. I haven't seen them, but yeah. yeah. And yeah. you know, no, and there's some really good epidemiological evidence that extended isolation and that not feeling like you have a primary emotional attachment to anyone, right? Um, there's been this anxiety about kinless adults, like what's going to happen to old people who don't have children and don't have partners, and their parents are dead or whatever. They don't have siblings. Um, so there's a lot of anxiety around this. And, and, and I think that this is the extreme result of societies which really prize individualism and prize competition and prize the hustle and prize all of the things that can come from that mm -hmm. in terms of individual autonomy and self-actualization. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not the kind of person who's going to say not being like we shouldn't be self-actualized. I mean, I, 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 there's a whole literature about what self-actualization means and how it's culturally constructed. And I don't want to get into that here. Mm -hmm. But what I want to say is that we as uh, contemporary North Americans, and I would say in many parts of the global North, we have really elevated self-actualization above community and connection. Mm -hmm. um, the balance is out of whack. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we need to get that balance back into some semblance of normality, because I think many of us are really living these isolated, despairing lives yeah. because we've been sold 
this ideal that self-actualization is the most important thing. And, mm -hmm. and, and we just know, right, psychologically, epidemiologically, now we have good evidence that it's actually not good for us. And, mm -hmm. and I just want to say one last thing. I know we're a little bit over time. It's okay, yeah. I have this wonderful new colleague at the University of Pennsylvania who's just been hired in the anthropology department. She's a biological anthropologist. And her name is Malika Sarma, S-A-R-M-A. -A. I encourage everybody to go find her work because she does these, she's a biological anthropologist and she does these studies that look at human biology at the extremes. So she works with NASA and she looks at human biology in space flight, in the International Space Station in orbit. She looks at hunter gatherers in the Congo, uh, where there are high pathogenic loads. She looks at people who are um, living or you know trying to survive or hiking in high altitudes, right? So these these um, extreme environments, and I mean we could add here like climate change, extreme heat, right, or mm -hmm. extreme cold. So 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 climatic or geographic conditions that are really really hostile to human biology. And what she does is she actually goes in and she takes saliva samples and she can measure cortisol. She can measure, measure testosterone. She can measure the human response, right? And it turns out that, uh, not surprisingly, when our bodies are stressed because of these um, factors, these biological factors, because we're in environments that are hostile to us, mm -hmm. cortisol, cortisol levels, stress levels go through the roof, right? Mm -hmm. And these high levels of cortisol, they mess with our neuroendocrine system. They make us less uh, productive, uh, no, less efficient at, um, you know, caloric balance. Like we burn more calories. Basically, we expend more energy than we otherwise should. Mm -hmm. And uh, vestibular function can also be affected. Like we actually move through the world less well when we're under these high amounts of stress because of the environment. So mm -hmm. guess what mitigates against it? Guess what she finds through yeah. her studies of taking saliva samples mm -hmm. being in community with other people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you're together with others, right, even in your, you're, you're together in these extremely harsh environments, mm -hmm. it turns out that our bodies physically work, mm. function better when we're together with others than when we're alone. That mm. should not be surprising, again, because evolutionary biology has mm. you know, made us these social creatures. But as we move into a very hostile, potentially even deadly, deadly, you know, set of conditions mm. on the planet, one of the technologies that we are going to need to survive and thrive as human beings, as mm. species, is going to be these connections to other people. Mm -hmm. So I feel like we need to start working on those now. We mm -hmm. need to start prioritizing those. And those are discuss discussions that we're just not having in quite the way that we need to be having them, as far as mm -hmm. I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm hoping that people will see, will take away from this book. I unfortunately learned about uh, Malika's work after the book mm -hmm. was off into mm -hmm. the press. It wasn't out yet, but it was too late for me to change it. But yeah. Um, but I think it's really important to realize that we are now, we now have this epidemiological evidence and we have this incredible biological, anthropological, biological and anthropological evidence that shows that we thrive in community. Now, I don't want to romanticize it. Mm -hmm. for those who were raised in competitive capitalist societies, you know, with our single family homes and our exclusive bi-parental care surrounded by all our private stuff that we never had to share our Barbies with anybody. We didn't have mm -hmm. to get, you know, the dream house out of the Barbie bank or whatever, the Barbie library. Um, I do think that it's, it's going to be an adjustment, but mm -hmm. community, uh, individualism and um, communitarianism, these are forms of being in the world that are very flexible. They're learned, they can be unlearned. Mm -hmm. So I think we have the ability to change, but mm -hmm. we just have to believe that these changes will be worth it mm -hmm. in the end, right? And we yeah. have to go about it, not in a school marmy scoldy way of like, you know, you need to have less stuff or you need to, um, you know, do X, Y, or Z because it is the morally correct thing to do because the planet is burning. Mm -hmm. That's the wrong, we, I'm done with the scoldy left. I think what we need <laughs> is that joyous left that says, guess what? Mm -hmm. 
if we live more communally, we're all going to go to a hell of a lot more parties mm -hmm. and we're going to have a hell of a lot more fun. We're mm -hmm. going to have a ton more sex, you know, mm -hmm. and we're just going to be able to stumble home and um, you know, wake <laughs> up in the morning. And, and there are going to be people there who are going to help us get through the hangover that will inevitably have in the morning mm -hmm. and the heartbreaks mm -hmm. that will inevitably have and the jealousies. Mm -hmm. Again, I don't want to romanticize it. Of course, mm -hmm. it's going to be different and difficult, but it could be fun too, right? Mm -hmm. Not sitting alone, you know, at one o'clock in the morning shopping on Amazon because you <laughs> feel like your life has no meaning or whatever. And somehow yeah. you know, buying just the right color headband or scrunchie is going to be. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. No, that's, uh, yeah, that's such a great point. And it's so fascinating. I'm glad you brought up uh, Malika Sharma's work because um, I think, I mean, even for me, like as a new mom, I think even the stress of that has made me suddenly not an introvert, right? And I think that's the biggest um, thing that people are, are fearful about because I think there's a lot of people who identify as introverts, um, but I'm like, is that an innate part of you or is that because we've just spent so long living in this extremely alienated like capitalist society where um we are alone all the time and then it becomes you know like people were talking about during the pandemic when people were inside so much and then they tried to go out and then you know reconnect with people it was kind of awkward and, and jarring and you had to relearn those social skills right so if we're just spending all of our time avoiding those kind of social connections is it that we actually are fearful of them and that we we would rather be alone or is it that we've just been taught to to live that way but in other in other circumstances like it may be in a more stressful circumstance you actually would feel like no i actually want community around i actually want you know people around right so anyway just very interesting and yeah, it's just interesting I mean, concept. Right. And, and, you know, and again, I think there's this, this idea and that I want to come back to because, you know, as an ethnographer, when we study human societies, again, cross-culturally and trans-historically, what is the key thing that distinguishes humanity? Like it's our flexibility and adaptability and creativity. We are so adaptable. And, and that's one of these things, like maybe, my introversion, your introversion, people out there who really like to spend a lot of time alone, maybe that's a reaction to the, to the, the environment within which we live, where there are so many demands on our time and attention that we get depleted, mm -hmm. right? And, and then, you know, you have like one primary partner, you know, and that person needs all of their emotional support and validation from you. Mm -hmm. And you need all of your emotional validation and support from them. Mm -hmm. And so, you, you know, at the end of those interactions, you're like, oh, okay, I don't have yeah. anything to give, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but if we mm -hmm. lived in these wider networks and everybody was getting a little bit from everybody else, right, maybe that would be just right maybe mm -hmm. that would that would create you know a, a, an abundance of support and care rather than this um scarcity of support and care and we do absolutely 100 percent live i would say right now in societies that have a scarcity of care mm -hmm, mm -hmm. a scarcity of connection and so you know the the answer is not to buy it right or or to you know i mean they, you know I, the way that people talk about this is really strange um you know, it's too like, it's too, it, it, like, we know that it can generate it naturally. I mean, you, we've all been, even me, like I'm, I, you know, I have some social anxiety parties, especially big parties, you know, they, mm -hmm, they, mm -hmm. they, they can be kind of uncomfortable for me, especially when I have same, to make small talk, you know, oh God, yes. I don't really know. Yeah. yeah. But you know, a dinner party with like eight or nine people mm -hmm. um, that maybe I don't know, but I've just met at a conference, I heard their work or whatever, or, you know, a, a group of writers or a group of people, you know, that, you know, I might have a connection to, you know, eight or nine or 10 or whatever. Um, under the right circumstances, you know, maybe with a couple glasses of wine, mm -hmm. I walk away from that feeling filled rather than depleted. Mm -hmm. I think everybody's had that experience, right? Mm -hmm. for, you know, for different people, some people go to those big parties and are like, woo, that was the best thing ever, right? They're just feeling absolutely, you know, um, recharged by it. Mm -hmm. but, but I think that we, we can, un we can see, we can feel in our own lives, like your camping trip this weekend, <laughs> right? Like there's a way in which community can be incredibly, um, so, like, I don't know, joyful. I guess that's the word that I want to use is joyful, yeah, not right. training, right? right. Yeah. It, it can be about abundance rather than scarcity. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that we tend to think too much in terms of scarcity and not enough in terms of abundance. And that's just a cognitive switch that we kind of need 
to flip. Mm -hmm. Um, And I do that sometimes, you know, when I'm feeling really a little socially anxious or something, and and Mm -hmm. I'm in a room with people that I, you know, might go up and talk to, but that I'm a little shy to just sort of initiate a conversation. Mm -hmm. I'll be like, rather than thinking of this as a, a, as a, as an interaction that might end up in depletion, what about thinking of it, like just prefiguring it as an interaction that will, that will enhance, right? That will grow Mm -hmm. uh, some sort of affective connection. And Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. sometimes just making that decision to Mm -hmm. approach an interaction, even for somebody like an introvert, Mm -hmm. can can really change things, right? People Mm -hmm. react to each other like, oh, wow, this person is being friendly, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm. And I, you know, I, I, I do think that we've lost, like you, you just said this during the pandemic, mm-hmm. a lot of people lost this, like it yeah. like we forgot mm-hmm. how to make small talk. We forgot how to have those weird, awkward conversations when you're in the elevator with somebody or whatever, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. We, we, we once understood that. And so it, it can atrophy. And with it can atrophy, that means that it can also be mm-hmm. flexed and strengthened mm-hmm. like a muscle. Mm-hmm. And that's what I'm trying to say in this book is that there's a way in which really rethinking the way that we interact with others in our private lives is this intervention point for politics. And we need to be joyful and, and, and capacious in our willingness to believe that we can change things for the better in a community together with others. Because our excitement about that, our enthusiasm is mm-hmm. going to be contagious. It's going mm-hmm. to create this sort of contaminationist way of bringing other people together with us in our desire to build a more just, equitable, and sustainable world. That's mm-hmm. basically the core message the that core I message. get across. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. I think it was Adrian Marie Brown who said um, that we need to make our mood so joyful that they're irresistible to other people. You know, the people are just see them and they're like, we have to join that, you know? Um, so yeah, I just love that that is the core message of this book. Again, fantastic book. I recommend it to everyone who has been listening. Um, thank you, Kristen, so much for, for coming on the show and for talking about this with me. I think this was an incredible talk in the chat. I've been loving it. And thank you to everyone in the chat for coming and for contributing. Um, just thanks all around. <laughs> thank you so much. All right. Well, have a great, I guess you're still morning there it's me it's afternoon yeah. here so i'm gonna yeah. go off and yeah enjoy have, that excellent have a great rest of your day. Day. yeah oh good perfect right. thank you so much talk soon take care bye take care bye